so to the Camino de Santiago. For those of you who are, who are not familiar with it, the term Camino de Santiago covers a number of pilgrim routes that all converge on the city of Santiago in the region of Galicia in northwest Spain. More specifically, the routes converge in the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in the heart of the city, which is built on the site of what many believe to be the final resting place of one of Christ's twelve apostles. And how the Apostle James ended up in Galicia is quite a story in itself. And indeed, the incredible legend of St. James has been woven into my own story, and I'll say a little bit more about this later. Before embarking on my pilgrimage in 2016, I actually thought that there was only one Camino route, that being the Camino Francis, the French way, which is by far the most popular of all the routes. However, a good friend of mine, Tom Blacker, introduced me to a book by Brent McManus. Brent's a Jesuit priest based here in Belfast. Uh, and I then had my eyes, eyes open to the fact that there were indeed a number of Camino routes, as illustrated on the slide. Brent himself had walked the Camino del Norte as illust um, a couple of years earlier, and was a direct result of reading his book that I decided to work, walk this, uh, this northern route also. By the way, Brent has since become a, a good friend, and his book, Redemption Road, is an excellent read. In fact, I would have no hesitation in saying that if you only ever buy two communal books in your life, <laughs> <laughs> The Camino del Norte follows the north coast of Spain from a ruin on the French-Spanish border for 625 kilometers all the way to Ribadeo before working its way inland for another 190 kilometers or so to Santiago. This was my second long distance walk in memory of Jackie. And as I, as I completed 1,000 kilometers around the Ulster Way the previous year, I resolved to walk the same distance in Spain. So after reaching Santiago, I walked out to the west coast of Spain to Murcia, and then down the coast to Finisterre, and then back to Santiago for a second time, which added on another 200 kilometers. The route along the north coast passes through some absolutely beautiful towns and cities, such as San Sebastian, Guernica, Gijón, Santiana del Mar, and San Vicente, to name but a few. And I lost count of the number of beautiful beaches that I encountered along the way and walked upon. However, the route also presented plenty of challenges. Lots of steep mountains and hills, rough terrain, heat, wind and rain. Quite similar to the Ulster Way, in fact, except maybe for the heat bit. However, the one very significant difference between the Ulster Way and the Camino was a terrific sense of camaraderie on the Camino. Don't get me wrong, I had a tremendous amount of support when I was undertaking the Ulster Way pilgrimage. In fact, I couldn't have achieved it without the tremendous help I had from many friends and family. But with the odd exception, the majority of that walk <clears throat> was through some, on my own, through some very desolate and isolated landscapes. Very few people ever walked the Ulster Way, and I often walked for many miles without seeing another living soul. However, the Camino is very different indeed. Literally hundreds of thousands of people, of pilgrims, now walk the various Camino routes each year, mostly over the summer months and mostly on the Camino Francis. The Camino del Norte route is certainly much quieter, but you maybe still have a cohort of, say, over 40 pilgrims walking along each stage, each day during the summer months. So there's always the opportunity to meet many like-minded people along the way and certainly at the beginning and the end of each of the stages. They may all be walking for very different reasons, be they religious, spiritual, physical, or simply a desire to escape from normal life for the time. But here's the thing, everyone is going the same way, heading in the same direction towards a common des destination. And that common purpose somehow leads to surprisingly strong bonds being readily formed between pilgrims following the way of St. James. If I was only allowed to choose one word to sum up the Camino experience, it would be camaraderie. 
The slide behind is a montage of some of the fellow films <coughs> met on my Camino and who also feature in the book. And I still keep in con contact with quite a few of them, such as Jimmy from Scotland and Kanishka from the Czech Republic, Michael from Germany, Ron from Holland, there's like all these snaps in there, <laughs> <laughs> and my very good friend Ray, who is originally from Ireland but has lived and worked in Germany for the past 30 years or so. And as I say in my book, he consequently was fluent in both German and cursing. <laughs> of course, I had my own very personal reasons for going on this pilgrimage to this sacred place in Santiago. As I mentioned before, it was another long journey in memory of Jackie. It was also to raise funds for Cancer Research UK. And then there was also a quest element to my pilgrimage. I was still very much in the early stages of grief, and I still felt pretty lost. really hoped that the Camino might lead to some place where I could find some peace of mind. I was really struggling to know how to go on, how to move forward in life without Jackie. So I dearly hoped that this pilgrimage would eventually lead me to some place of peace, indeed a place of sanctuary. And it did, but not quite in a way that I had ever anticipated. My book's not a guidebook as such, but for anyone interested in walking the Camino, it does provide a very good insight into all that's involved and what you might expect, should you ever decide to choose to embark upon this uh, centuries-old pilgrimage. To find out about the locals and their customs, the markers and signs to look out for, the weather and the terrain, the types of pilgrims, some serious, some casual, the hostels and, and albergues, some good, some mm, not so good. <laughs> the gear you need and the stuff you can do without, the sleeping conditions, and of course, the snoring. And believe me, you will almost certainly encounter some incredible snoring. Camaraderie was, camaraderie was my first word of choice to sum up the communal experience, but if I was allowed to choose a second word, it would be snoring. <laughs> Indeed, there were times when the snoring of other pilgrims in the shared dorms really, in my view, put the grin <laughs> into the pilgrimage. <laughs> and I have to admit to booking myself into the occasional hotel and private pension along the way just to get a bit of respite from the, uh, the noises, the nocturnal noises. But don't worry, I probably painted too dark a picture there in the snoring. It's not that bad. But don't worry, everything else about the Camino really makes up for the occasional discomfort, honestly. I would now like to read a few extracts from my book, starting with one that highlights what I've just been talking about, the contrast between the challenges and the beauty of an experience on the Camino. And it was while staying at this wonderful alberg in Guimes with uh, my friend Ray, Unfortunately, the tranquility of Guimes did not last. I was sharing a dormitory with eight other pilgrims, including Ray. It was very spacious and comfortable, and I fell asleep quickly after such an exhausting and eventful day. However, it wasn't long before I was woken by a large German woman sleeping in the bunk opposite. She was without doubt the most consistent, long-distance snorer I had encountered on my travel so far. Even my earplugs provided little resistance to whatever particular frequency this woman was broadcasting at. I pushed them in as far as they could, pulled the pillow over my head, and managed to get some intermittent sleep between her snoring episodes, which seemed to make the very room vibrate. The next morning, I rose at dawn after a torturous night spent enjoying brief periods of sleep constantly interrupted by the jackhammer and operated by the German woman in the bunk opposite. As I lifted my head slowly up off the pillow, groaning feebly in the process, I looked over at her, fully expecting to see her in a hard hat and bent over a pneumatic tool, perhaps even displaying ample builder's bum. She was fast asleep and looked an absolute picture of tranquility and innocence. She stirred as I was getting dressed, She stirred as I was getting dressed and greeted everyone with a very pleasant guten morgen, 
totally oblivious to the nightly mayhem she had inflicted on her neighbor mates. Of course, no one said a word to her about her snoring, but simply responded to her greeting with a chorus of good mornings in a variety of languages. There seems to be an unwritten rule amongst pilgrims not to comment on other, others' nocturnal habits, well, not to their faces anyhow. I was on my way round to the shower block to try and freshen up when I was met by Ray, who was rushing back toward the dorm to fetch me. Have you got your camera? he asked excitedly. I held out my